In this video, we discuss how to calculate heat when heating or cooling objects. Heat is the second type of energy transfer together with work. Now, the determination of heat can be complicated, but it's actually simple when the only thing that is happening is a change in temperature in an object. So our process would be something like, suppose that you have a glass of water, and now you're going to transfer some energy to that uh, glass of water as heat, and then the temperature should go up, right? Determining heat in that process is straightforward, and that's something that we're going to do in this video. All right, so uh, when you transfer energy as heat to an object, the object changes temperature according to its heat capacity, which we're going to call C. And it turns out that there's a direct proportionality between the amount of energy transferred as heat and the change in temperature and that proportionality is precisely what the heat capacity is, right? So the connection between heat, which we're going, to, we're going to call Q, and the change in temperature is this one. Now, this would be for a macroscopic change, but uh, of course in thermodynamics we always worry first about a microscopic change, a differential change, and then we generalize to uh, the macroscopic change, so we write this expression simply as a small change in temperature and a small amount of energy transfer as heat. Okay, and again, generalization is very straightforward. You simply have to uh, integrate both sides of the equation, and there you go. Okay, this is what you have to do here from temperature one to temperature two. Now, most of the time, we're going to consider that the heat capacity of an object which again is the sensitivity of the object to change its temperature when some energy is supplied to it as heat, uh, most of the time that heat capacity will not depend on temperature. Right, so notice that if DC does not depend on temperature, then you can factor it out of the integral, and then what you have right here is something very simple, that is just heat capacity delta T. Okay, and again, this is going to work most of the time but if you're doing very accurate work, it turns out that those heat capacities do depend on temperature. And what that means is that uh, in order to solve this expression, you will have to carry out the integral explicitly, and we will learn how to do that in a couple of homework problems. Okay? Now, uh, the heat capacities of objects uh, or of substances depend on the type of substance. Uh, there are substances that have very low heat capacities, for example, metals. And, and those substances, uh, those species, when you transfer some energy as heat to a metal, it heats up really fast. And that's because it has a very low heat capacity. Now, there are other substances that have higher heat capacities. For example, water, liquid water, has a relatively high heat capacity for its molar mass. Uh, and it turns out that uh, that is advantageous because we can use water as a very good uh, a coolant liquid, right? Because when you transfer a lot of energy as heat to that liquid water, it's not going to change its temperature very much, okay? And that is useful for thermal regulation and so forth. All right, so uh, the, the way that uh, we normally uh, think about heat capacities is one where uh, we actually don't have heat capacities that are uh, extensive, as what you have right here. So this heat capacity, would depend on whether you have one gram, 10 grams, or one kilogram of the substance. Instead, we always like to work with heat capacities that are intensive, right? That do not depend on how much material you have, right? So there's going to be a couple of, of expressions then for those heat capacities, right? So um, for example, we're going to derive, we're going to see that the most common heat capacity that we're going to be working with is called the molar heat capacity, and that is simply going to be your uh, heat capacity divided over the number of moles, okay? So let's work at uh, what the units of all of these heat capacities would be. All right, notice that uh, heat is uh, energy transfer, so it is simply joules. Then the heat and the change in temperature is going to be Kelvin in the SI system, and that means that your uh, extensive heat capacity would be joules per Kelvin. Okay, notice that if now we go to the molar heat capacities, and those are the ones that we're going to be using most frequently, okay, that will be joules per Kelvin in the numerator, divided over mole, 
so that is going to be joules per mole per kelvin. And this is a, a unit very simple to, uh, very easy to remember because it's the same unit as they are constant joules per mole per kelvin. Okay, so then the question is, well, if we have tables with more heat capacities, which we do in the textbook, how do we use them to calculate uh, energy transfers as heat to a particular object when that object is, is cooling or heating? Well, notice that uh, you can rearrange this expression, which is this one, to uh, notice that your heat capacity, the extensive one, is simply the number of moles times the molar heat capacity, and then you can replace that into here. And we're, we're then going to write here a new expression to show you how that would work. All right, so uh, uh, we can do that here. That would be the definition and say that uh, most commonly the expression that we're going to be using is going to be this one. T1, T2, number of moles times the molar heat capacity differential of T. Okay, that is what happens, uh, how the uh, expression for heat changes when you use molar heat capacities. And again, that's going to be very frequently the case. There's yet another expression that we can find uh, that doesn't use molar heat capacities. Instead, it uses specific heat capacities. Specific heat capacities are on a per gram basis or per unit mass basis, right? So uh, generally, this is uh, kind of an old notation, and you will find this in all textbooks. Right, the specific heat capacity is simply your heat capacity of the substance uh, over the mass, which I'm going to write as mass. But you notice that the units of that would be, uh, in the SI system, would be joules per kilogram uh, per Kelvin. Okay, but there's all kinds of units that one might find, right? So, uh, for example, grams, uh, joules per grams per Kelvin would be here as well, and actually the original uh, energy transfer as heat unit would be calories per uh, gram per degree Celsius, which again is, is kind of the original one, but of course we're moving away from that old uh, system of units, and uh, we prefer to use uh, the SI uh, unit, uh, units now, and that would be the, uh, the units in the SI system. Now, uh, how do we then write up our expression for heat? Well, if you have specific heat capacities, that will simply be the mass, which I can write as simply mass. C sub S, the specific heat capacity, and then differential of T from T1 to T2. Okay, so uh, notice that all the expressions are very similar, right? This is kind of the pattern, pattern expression, and then you just have to figure out whether you have a molar heat capacity or a specific heat capacity. And, and again, that will be what the expressions turn into once you consider what type of heat capacity uh, you have. All right, to illustrate all these points, why don't we do a numerical example just to show you that this is not very complicated at all. The calculation is going to be uh, simply to just figure out uh, how much energy as heat do you need to transfer to a glass of water to elevate its temperature uh, from, say, uh, 10 Celsius to 20 Celsius. Okay, so let's try to figure out uh, that. All right, so uh, the only data that we have uh, is that the change in temperature for this problem uh, is 10 Kelvin, right? So 10 Celsius to 20 Celsius, you transform it to Kelvin, then take the difference, and that happens to be uh, 10 Kelvin. So we're going to write here three significant figures. And now uh, we also have the molar heat capacity for water, which uh, is 75.29 joules per mole Kelvin. And we also have that our glass of water has or has a volume of 200 milliliters. Okay, so uh, first things first, uh, notice that you have a molar heat capacity of air for water. So the expression that you're, you're going to be using is this one. Now, very importantly, uh, notice that the number of moles is constant, and then uh, the molar heat capacity is also constant, right? Notice that here you just have a number that does not depend on whether the temperature is 10 Celsius or 20 Celsius, seems to have seems to be the same number throughout the temperature range. And that means that it's also a constant. So you can factor this out of the integral, and then what you have is simply NCM, integral of differential of T from T1 to T2. But of course, that integral is only delta T, right? Or simply delta T. So this is going to be NCM 
delta t. And just how simple the expression is, you simply have to calculate number of moles, then you have to you have to plug in your molar heat capacity, and then multiply by the change in temperature, and you're done. Again, this, this one will not be very uh, difficult. Really, the only challenge is to make sure that you use the right units, and then make sure that you understand what's the difference between an extensive heat capacity or upper mole heat capacity or a specific heat capacity. All right, so let's then punch in the numbers. We just have to uh, transform those that volume into a number of moles, but we can do that through the density, so 200 mils, and then we have one uh, gram per milliliter, that is the density of water, so that transforms my volume into grams, and then it can divide by uh, the molar mass of water, one mole over 18.02 grams, that is the molar mass, so that gives me a number of moles of 1.1 1 .1, uh, moles, okay, 1.11 moles. So we have here 1.11 mole multiplied by the molar heat capacity, which is 75.29 joule per mole Kelvin, and then we multiply this by the change in temperature, just 10 Kelvin, and then that gives me a number of 8.36 10 to the 3 joules. Okay, that's a huge amount of energy. You have to transfer more than 8,000 joules in order to elevate the temperature of a glass of water, uh, a cup of water, uh, uh, just by 10, 10 degrees. And again, that's because this number, this heat capacity, this more heat capacity for water, is relatively large. Okay, uh, and again, that is an advantageous property because you can use water as an effective coolant. Okay, so now that we understand uh, how to calculate heat for heating and cooling uh, uh, objects, and then we also understand that the heat capacity comes in uh, many flavors like molar or specific, then we're going to wrap this video with one, uh, one, one more detail uh, that is important about uh, the heat capacity. And that is that the heat capacity depends on whether you're uh, doing this process at constant pressure or constant volume. Okay, so let's try to see if we can illustrate that relatively uh, easily. So here's the idea. Uh, suppose that you can uh, repeat this problem or, we, or uh, heating this water, uh, and you're going to do it, do it either at constant pressure or at constant volume. Uh, we're actually going to use water gas instead of liquid water just to illustrate the point a little more. Okay, so at constant pressure, what will happen is that you will have here this uh, water gas, and then you transfer uh, your energy as heat. Okay, but notice that uh, when you do that, what's going to happen is that that gas is actually going to expand, right? And when the, it does that, it, it actually uh, pushes the piston out. And when it pushes the piston out, it's doing some work. And what that means is it's actually losing some of the energy that is gaining through this heat. Ultimately, what that means is that the amount of uh, change in temperature that you will have in that uh, process of constant uh, pressure will actually be uh, a little smaller than what you will have if this process is done at constant volume. So at constant volume, you just block this piston and don't let it move. And now you're going to supply exactly the same amount of energy as heat. So we're going to say that maybe this is 10 joules, right, or whatever uh, you want. That really doesn't matter. And the key here is to recognize that this gas is not going to change the temperature by the same amount if you're uh, hitting it at a constant volume or at constant pressure. At constant volume, the energy has nowhere to go, right? You just supply those 10 joules of energy as heat, and the only thing that the gas can do is just elevate its temperature, okay? But here, uh, if you transfer that same amount of energy as heat, the gas will heat up, but it also is going to be able to push this piston out. Right, so as it pushes the piston out, some of the energy that you're transferring is being lost, okay? And that means that the temperature of the gas is going to increase a, le a little bit less. Ultimately, what this means is that there's two types of molar heat capacities, at constant pressure and at constant volume. The one that we have used here in this problem for liquid water was at constant pressure, and uh, that is going to be denoted with a C sub PM, okay, which we can write right here, C sub PM, C sub PM, C sub PM. Okay, because we were doing that process at constant pressure. That glass of water was open to the atmosphere where you have a constant pressure of 
one atmosphere. Okay, but if we had done this process uh, uh, at constant volume, okay, then the only thing that changes is that this CPM, uh, this CPM will be CVM for constant volume, VM, 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 and that number would have been different. Okay, uh, that number actually uh, would have been a little bit uh, smaller. Okay, so uh, all right. So from uh, uh, here, uh, we can just uh, com uh, finish this video by just uh, saying what we've done. We've examined the simplest case for calculating heat, uh, and that is just to uh, see what happens when the only process taking place is the heating or the cooling of an object, object to which you're transferring this energy as heat. Now, this is not the only type, uh, or, or, yeah, the only process where you will have uh, energy transfers as heat. There will be uh, other processes like chemical reactions, like phase transitions, and so forth, where you will have uh, also transfers of energy as heat. However, uh, uh, those processes uh, will be isothermal. Okay, so when they are isothermal, then you can't use this because this routine that we have uh, used here only applies for uh, heating and cooling. A chemical reaction that is isothermal, a phase transition that is isothermal. Notice that those, uh, the temperature will be constant and we will have to use a different recipe to calculate heat there. And we'll explain uh, how, to, uh, uh, how it works when we get there. Now in the next video we get uh, the two pieces that we have been explaining as of late, work and heat. Those are the two types of energy transfer that you have and we're going to put them together uh, into the first law, which is the law of energy conservation.